in this video, we're talking about some technical details related to the um, hypothesis testing procedure we've discussed when you're trying to estimate the population portion. So let's talk about the first thing, which is how do we know what the mean for p hat is? How do we know what its mean is, right? So p hat, remember, was x over n. And we said that x was binomial in nature, right? We said that was binomial in nature. And we actually learned that the expected value for the binomial distribution, which is the same as the mean value for binomial distribution, we learned that that was n times p earlier in the course, where n is the number of trials, p is the probability of success, right? And we also learned that the variance for x would be the same as n times p times q, where q was the complement of p. So if this one was 20, that's 80. If this one was 10, that's 90, so on and so forth. So this is the two conditions we have for the binomial distribution. So we could actually use that to help us figure out what's the mean of p hat, right? The thing is, it's not exactly x, so it's x over n, right? It's not exactly x. So we can't just use this formula, right? So we have to figure out then, how do we go about tackling that? Well, let's look at that. It turns out that we can define p hat, right? So if I want to know the expected value of p hat, I can say that that's the same as finding the expected value of 1 over n times x. Because remember that x times 1 over n is the same as x over n, right? So p hat is that. And then what we can do is to look at a very special rule. This rule is nice. It's a rule for expectation. And it says that if you want to know the expectation of something like a times x, where a is a constant, it turns out that it's just a times the expected value of x. So remember, the random variable here is x. a is a constant. We can just pull that constant out in front and multiply it by the expected value for x. That's all we have to do. So what we could say here is that if I want to know the expected value for this term, I can just pull this out in front and say 1 over n times the expected value of x. But we just said that the expected value of x, since x is binomial, is essentially going to be n times p. Right? And then from there, we can cross out these two n's and come to the conclusion that the expected value of p hat is just rho. The expected value or p hat is simply rho, the population proportion. That p represents the population proportion. And this is good because this means that p hat is an unbiased estimator of the population proportion rho, because its expected value is equal to the thing it's trying to estimate. That's a very nice feature. OK, so we have that. Good. Next thing we want to figure out is what's the standard error for p hat. To get the standard error, we're actually going to figure out the variance. Let's calculate the variance for it. So the variance for x over n is our interest, right? The variance for x over n. Well, that's the same as the variance for p hat, remember. That's the same as this guy. Let's try to figure that out. Well, it would be the same as saying the variance for 1 over n times x, right? So what we need is a rule, like we had before, for something like the variance of a times x. Well, it turns out that if you want to know the variance of a times x, where again, a is a constant and x is a random variable, we end up with this rule. You can take the a out in front, but you square it. The thing that comes out gets squared. It's a little different than we had before. Before the a just came out in front, now it comes out squared when you're dealing with variance. And you multiply by the variance of x. This is a very nice feature, because if we know that, then we can apply that rule here. We can say the variance is going to be basically 1 over n squared times the variance of x. Right? Times the variance of x. Well, x is a binomial random variable, so we just discussed its variance. We know what it is. So let's go ahead and finish then by saying the variance for p hat is essentially the same as 1 over n squared, right? Because if you square 1n, you get 1 over n squared. Not 1n, but 1 over n. You square that, and you get 1 over n squared times the variance of x, and we learned that the variance of x was n times p times q, right? And then just do a little cleanup. That's the same as n p q over n times n, right? n squared. And you cancel out the n's, and you end up with p q over n. And that's your variance for p hat. Once you know the variance, you can get the standard error by taking the square root. Remember that variance and standard deviation are related by a square root. So we can finish this up, this discussion up, by saying, hey, 
We know the we know the standard error that would be sigma of p hat is equal to the square root of the variance for that, and that will be equal to the square root of p times q over n, where p is your population proportion, q is the complement of that, and n is your sample size for the study. Okay, so now we know both its mean and its standard error, and that's why we use those quantities in the test stat formula. All right, so away from that, aside from those technical details, the next thing we want to discuss is what is the overall normal approximation to the binomial distribution trying to accomplish? Let's look at a, a scenario. If you look at a binomial distribution, they have these rectangle-shaped curves, right? They have rectangles of probability, that sort of thing, right? So you might have seen this before. You know, something like this, right? This is my drawing of an example of a binomial distribution. Let's say in this problem that the population proportion is actually 0 0.50, and the complement, of course, would then also be 5, 0, because they have to add up to 100. You try to fix a bell curve around this to ensure that um, you're approximating this probability using a bell curve. It would look something like that, right? You're fitting the bell curve over the shape of this. And you can see that it's a pretty good fit. It's doable, right? I mean, there's some errors some places where the curve um, here is, is under where it should be, places where it's over where it should be. So there's going to be little gaps and bulges where we're making mistakes. There's going to be an approximation reason for that. Of course, if you took this chunk and applied it there, you know, of course, it starts to balance out. But the general idea is that um, the curve here fits reasonably well, and it'll work pretty well in our examples. But this is under the scenario where P and Q are close to one another, almost the same, the exact same in this case, and because of that, the curve is nice and symmetric. It isn't symmetric any longer when these guys change, when they move away from one another. So if P becomes 60 and Q therefore would be 40, or 70, 30, or 80, 20, or 10, 90, in those scenarios, you end up having a more skewed looking curve. Let's take a very extreme scenario where the portion, the population proportion is something like 0 0.00001, and Q hat then would be uh, 0 0.99999, right? In that instance, you would get a very bizarre looking curve. Your curve would look something like this. You know, this was 0, 1, 2, 3. Remember, this is the x axis, the number of successes involved. If you have a very small probability of success, it means that all the probability is going to be here around the 0, right? All the probability would be there around 0 meaning that the bulk of your probability is that you have no successes because it's so unlikely to get a success, right? It'd be like if you're looking for a, ram, a rare type of brain tumor, for example, and you'd have almost nobody out of your sample ending up with that tumor. And then, you know, you'd have some small probability here, perhaps, and, you know, very small probability here, and then it would start to be virtually like a straight line down there. Imagine trying to fit a bell curve now around this shape in some way that you would actually get a reasonable approximation to this distribution using a bell curve. That would be very difficult. It, I pretty much would have to say that the only way that's realistically going to happen is perhaps if you had a really large sample size, and maybe on the order of 10,000 or 13,000, then you might get a good approximation to this. But in general, um, it wouldn't work too well. So what we're saying here is you got to be careful when the P is either really close to zero or really close to one. In either of those scenarios, you might not get a good fit, which means that your coverage probability for your confidence interval or your significance value or your probability of type one error, all that stuff that's involved in the hypothesis testing, that may be off of what you're promising. So you don't just want to blindly apply this proportion technique. It isn't um, as safe to do that just blindly as it would be for dealing with a situation with x bar. X bar, we have the central limit theorem, and it says that you know as long as n is large, x bar can be assumed to be normal. So using a bell curve in that scenario is pretty safe. Here we have to be careful. So there's a rule of thumb I'm going to quickly talk about that a lot of the textbooks have. Um, yeah, there's almost as many rules of thumbs as there are textbooks, I think. So what I want to say is that this is just one. You can use others. Um, the one that I would just say to use because it's very simple is just that if you have n times p naught. This p naught comes from your, um, this rho naught, sorry, but it comes from your null hypothesis. As long as that's greater than or equal to 15, n, so both of these things have to be true, and n times q naught is greater than or equal to 15, then you can usually safely use the procedure we learned earlier.
if this isn't true, then you want to be cautious and look up another technique. There are other techniques to work with the binomial distribution to do this. A lot of them are just adjustments to the procedure or the test that formula that we learned earlier. And in that case, um, they might get a better fit. They might work better than, um, than this procedure when these conditions aren't met. So just check these conditions. If they're met, you should feel safe using the procedure. And then from there, move on. You'll see some textbooks use five sometimes. Others that use other numbers. I mean, the point is, it's just a rough rule of thumb. There are lots of these rules of thumb out there. You would want to use the one that's laid out in your course if your teacher asked that of you.